So, 156 years ago, 1860, this is where my great, great grandfather, as a 10 year old boy, walked down this path to get on a train. The journey that this boy went on to become a man, a grandfather, a great grandfather, and a great, great, great grandfather is stuff of legends. And it's an incredible journey to understand how a young boy, 10 years old, left this village where his parents were silk weavers to go to Manchester, a city he'd never been to before. You see these nails here? What they used to do is they used to open the mouths, even when I first started in the business, open the mouths and shove the nails in like that. And then when they were hammering, well, put one out and then back, 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 back. You have to put them out now. They're not, they're not as tasty as they used to be. But that was called snobbing. That's what oh, they right. used to put it in the mouth and just whack. And they were masters at just being able to pull one out, whack yeah. it in, whack it in. So looking at these last in Rothwell, you know, 150 years ago, this is what was the town was about. They went from being silk weavers making flags for the military, and I guess they were diversifying into other areas, and shoemaking became one of the areas they became good at. And that's where William, when he came back from Manchester, started to learn his trade and got really interested in shoemaking. And as you can see, looking around, not just the town here, but all the equipment that they've managed to collect. It was about doing a quality job. And this town became successful and the people became successful because they produced a quality shoe. And if you look ahead to today, one of the things we like to pride ourselves on is we do a quality job. And to me, that was important then and it's important today. My great grandfather, what was he, 10? when he first got sent to work with his brother, who must, I don't think he was a very nice brother, <laughs> listen to him, he was absolutely real nasty guy. Anyway, uh, but between the age of 10 and 16, that, uh, my great grandfather seemed to learn a lot without going to school. He taught himself, I think a lot of the people who join us, they might not have got many GCSEs, and might not have got anywhere near an A-level, but my God, some of them are really smart. My great-grandfather started the business and took a very brave decision to take what was a pretty expensive shop at £1,000 a year rent. I mean, he was obviously very ambitious, but his ambitions didn't go beyond 26 shops because he called the first one, the one in Oldham Street, A shop, and then the next one just down the road was B shop, and another one down Oxford Road was C shop, and so on. So when he got to Z, he'd run out. So that's why Levenshoe became one, and Chalton became two, and Birkenhead was three, and the shop I worked in, Railway Street Oldfield, was number four. Welcome. Oh, thank you very much. Thank Do you. Do come through. Brilliant. So what's what's great to know is that my great great grandfather's house. The better thing, he looks slightly younger there. Is now he? being used for hundreds of children over the last mm. 60 years have been happy, you know, very happy times here. Yeah, the, the children are very much aware of the fact that this was the, the Timpson family home. And, and we, we refer to the school as the house as well. Um, and, and, and the word home comes through often. I know a lot of, a lot of the history comes back to here and yeah. this building itself is a really important part of it. So why is it called St Peter's School? I think that the idea of St Peter and having the keys to the gate and the keys of knowledge and using that connection. Well ironically they weren't cutting keys in 1946 <laughs> but we are now. <laughs> well thank you very much for showing us around it's been it's been a real privilege thank you. Oh, well I'm so pleased that you were able to come back and see us at St Peter's School Sunnylands. I mean, I never knew the founder. I mean, I'm not that old, but I did know my grandfather, Mr. Will, as he was known in the business, really quite well. 
when he died aged 80, uh, I was 17 and I actually had started working as a shop assistant and I was, there was one occasion when he came into the shop where I was, so that, that, that's a great link. He just found people interesting. He was a genial sort of guy. You immediately felt ease, at ease with him and that's what he did. And I think that although he worried about the detail of the business, he didn't go around nitpicking. He went around to talk to the people. So he didn't say, change the window, do that. He didn't order people about. It was much more of a soft touch. And I think that's the way we do it now. The ones being very, very good at, at men's shoes in particular was fantastic at property. And he, used, he built up a tremendous property portfolio, which I used to my advantage. Without that, I would not have been able to do the management buyout in 1983 because we had to we raised 30 million pounds by selling the shops that my great my grandfather had bought in the 30s so here what you can see is a normal playing field in the middle of a housing estate was once a really significant part of the Timpson business because over there built in 1929 was one of the biggest shoe factories in Britain and it was the Timpson factory built to make 20,000 pairs of shoes a week for the growing business. And it wasn't just the shoe factory in 1929 was significant, it was the year that the business went public. Because in 1926, William Timpson, the founder, died and the family had to pay death duties. So the way they did that was by floating the business. So two really significant things happened. The business was floated and this huge factory employing up to 1,000 people all around here made 17 million pairs of shoes for royalty, for footballers, for the army, and this was where the fortunes of the business were made. My father, he spent two or three years working in the factory there. My father, by the time he got in, he was in a difficult place. Suddenly, we were surrounded by an enormous number of shoe shops. So, uh, 75 different chains of shoe shops with 10 shops or more in the 70s. And then loads of other shops started selling shoes. There was Marks and Spencers and Littlewoods and all the mail order companies. And uh, then the clothing shops, the Burtons and Dorothy Perkins and so on. They were all selling shoes. And suddenly the fashion changed just at the time when cheaper imports were coming in, synthetic materials being used, the price of new shoes dropped enormously. And the shoe repair business went down by 15% for three years running. Not 15% over three years, 15% then, 15% then, 15%. We had to do something. I mean, that business, I mean, if we hadn't have done something then, we'd never have today's business at all. We sold hosiery, we sold leather goods, we sold straw shopping baskets. But the one thing that worked was key cutting. Because reluctantly, we managed to persuade our cobblers to cut keys. The big lesson to me was that the only way to survive as a shoe repairer on the high street is to do something else as well. It wasn't that long before the people who worked with us got that and understood that this was their long-term survival, was to be able to cut keys and then do engraving and then eventually watch repairs. It's strange I'm talking to you now in what is our current boardroom. I've only known two. And the previous boardroom just down the road in the old uh, Timpson House, which is now Tesco, that was where suddenly what I thought was going to be easily planned, definite future came to an abrupt end when uh, the, uh, the board fell apart. My uncle and my father fell out and the rest of the board sided with uncle and they forced my father to resign as chairman and uh, leave the building. That actually, when I think about it, uh, was totally out of context with everything that had gone for a hundred and something years before that uh, and probably for the last 40 or so years since. I think when people look at what my dad did in buying the business back they will see it as an incredibly risky um, decision that fortunately paid off for us but actually when you're in a business and you don't have the options then 
what others perceive as risk is actually common sense. And yes, you know, it, we we're all fortunate to look back now that the whole thing worked out, and it was a risky decision, but we didn't have actually many, many choices. And we've all benefited from seeing how those decisions have panned out and judging our decisions of the future um, on how he has managed the growth and sort of saving the business really in, in the past. When I started, I was Mr. John, my father was Mr. Anthony, and it was my grandfather was Mr. Will. There was that little bit of difference. And uh, the office down the road was very different. I mean, there were parking bays with numbers on them, and the, the number indicated how far you are up the pecking order. And there were four different dining rooms, the general one, the junior executive, senior executive, and the directors, and different lavatories. Would you believe? I mean, I think we're much more as one. All the colleagues in the business, and I regard myself as a colleague, we're all together part of the same team. It was different then. I think if my great-great-grandfather was sitting here today and we were having a chat about how the business is run now and compared to how he ran it, I'm sure there would be lots of differences, but just how society is so different now compared to then. But there are lots of things that are similar, which is you look after your people, you are conservative, um, you take educated risks, and it's important that it's a family business. And you know, if you look at the past, when the, the business has been unsuccessful, it's when it hasn't done those things, it hasn't looked after its people, it's gone out of family control, and they've taken risky decisions. So I, I do think there are lots of similarities to the way we run it now. But for, for me, the main values are, is you look after your people first, you look after your people second, and you look after your people third. The pride you get is just when you go to the shops and you actually turn out that it works. That somehow this funny old upside down system that we started to talk about 20 years ago is working so well for the business but it's also so working so well for the people. And I think that's certainly something we, I'm personally proud of. I think that what what the business has done for people leaving prison is something that James should be enormously proud of. A lot of people look at John and I as the leaders of the business, and it's not just the John and James show at all. You know, we have a fantastic team of people who we rely on completely to run the business day to day and to help us make important decisions. But also, John and I have both been very fortunate to be married to very strong women who are very clear thinkers and their priority is to look after their family and the people who we work with. Alex was very, very interested in the business. And, of course, she was able to act like a sort of non-executive director without having to be a go... Because you'd never go to a board meeting, because anything that lasted more than an hour would bore her to death. Uh, but she, she, she had enough knowledge of what was going on, but she was just looking at it from a little bit further away I was able to see things that I couldn't see. And to me, that has been a crucial thread running through the last 15, 20 years since I've been involved in the business. I was desperately unhappy when I had to sell the shoe shops. It was just about the worst thing I could have contemplated and I hated having to tell people. It was, looking back, the right thing to do. Uh, but I'm pretty pleased the way we turned around the shoe repair business. I don't think many people would have thought that a, a chain of shoe repair shops, which in those days we had about <clears throat> 140, making less than 400,000 pounds a year, would turn into a 1,400 shop business with profits, which is going up through 20 million towards 30 million. Uh, but I don't feel I did it, you see, because I didn't. It's been done by other people, but I'm pretty proud to have a part of it. I get asked a lot and think a lot about the future. And for me, there are some pretty basic things we need to keep doing. One is we need to keep growing. Secondly, we need to keep looking after our people. And thirdly, we need to make sure it's still a family business. And I think if we can manage those three things well, then I feel that I will have done my job well.